by beat from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When April comes to Broadway, the street is wide enough for everybody. Blondes in convertibles, Pekingese in taxis, and sailors and college fellows and convention fellows. It's the place to come to, for one reason or another. To be a tourist, to make a pitch, buy a bargain, get cheated, insulted, or have your picture taken. And when nighttime comes, walk beneath the special moon that hangs high over Broadway. Run with it, get lost in the cloud shadows that scud across its face. Good time to make a memory, depending upon how much you paid, what you wanted, what you got. And the quality of night on the street where I was was hush, lapping against cool gray stone, Sutton Place, and inside, paneled room devoted to books in red leather sets, pipe racks, carved mahogany desk, and jade chessmen. Man-type room for seclusion, for man-type problems, now given over to this, man stabbed to death with ivory-handled letter opener. Also man who doesn't believe it. It'll take time, Mr. Clover. This has happened to me before, you know. No, I didn't know. Several times. Dreams. Mm-hmm. And this setup here has a dreamlike quality to it. Don't you think so? No, I don't think so, Mr. Reed. I see. So there'll be no awakening from it, will there? Uh-uh. Well... You ready to tell me about it? Mr. Dayton. Him. Mr. Dayton called me at 7 o'clock at my place, said... Bring your book and be here at ten. Your book? I'm Mr. Dayton's secretary. I thought I told you that. Oh, go on. Oh, I knew my evening was loused up all right as soon as Mr. Dayton said that. Loused up? That's mild for what's happening now, isn't it? M- Mr. Reed... Uh... Well, at ten, I let myself in. I have a key, you know. I've been with Mr. Dayton some ten years now. He gave me a key because these sort of evenings are not infrequent. So you walked into the library and you found Mr. Dayton... Exactly like this, and I buzzed you... How strange. What is? The dream quality is gone. You know, I'm convinced that this really is happening. I'm glad for you. Now, tell me, Mr. Reed, what what kind of business was Mr. Dayton in? Real estate. He owned properties from Park Avenue to Harlem, inclusive, both ends. Exceptionally capable man. What kind of man was he to work for? Oh, kind, generous. Always felt for his tenants. Wondered how some of them could live like they did. How about his friends? Well... The women exclusively. You may as well know that. The line of business you're in and what you have to do now. A particular woman, Mr. Reed? Well, these last couple of months, I've sent flowers for him only to Miss Vance. Cecily Vance. I'll jot down her address for you if you wish it. Well, do you? I do. Well, you must admit the evening's really loused up. Wouldn't you say so? Miss Vance, Cecily Vance? Yes. I'm from the police, Danny Clover. And I am alone here, and things must be spelled out for me. Sure they do. Fill the badge, please. Thank you. Let's talk about it inside, huh, Miss Vance? But nowhere else than inside. Please come in. I know it's my place to think of something to say, something to offer. Just be content with the music coming from the record player. Let's talk about Frank Dayton. Frank? But what a nice gambit you've given me. I'm pleased, really pleased. About Frank Dayton? An infinite man. A good man. Kind, gentle, forbearing. And I'm a girl who can take a good deal of forbearance. Why do you make Frank our topic of conversation? Pleasant though it is. A little while ago, we found him murdered. Miss Vance. This place is mine. This incredible penthouse, this view of the city, and the miracle of it. Every night on the night. Did you hear me, Miss Vance? I said Frank Dayton Frank was... made it all possible. We were engaged. He showed me this place, and he said, get it ready for when we're married. So deep a fall to the pavement. No, don't touch me, Mr. Clover. I shan't do anything silly. I'm a very sensible girl. Good. And because you're like that, you know why I'm here. In the last few weeks, flowers I've had from Frank, but no Frank. 
And being as I'm so sensible, I would not kill a man who keeps dead memories fresh with cut flowers. Another woman? Is that what you're trying to tell me? I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to tell you. Just simply, so we won't waste time. There was a March day, soft, lush, and a ride with Frank to view his properties. And one of them where we stopped... Go on. Yes, go on. And a girl in a window, a girl 16 or all of 17, all of that. And Frank sat very quietly and looked at her. And I said, say something, Frank, and he did. What? He said, look at her, Cecily, and tell me what I am to say of a girl, of a girl that is a prayer, like the touch of wind in a twilight place. Frank never said words like that about me. About anyone or anything. Where was this place? Where else? Tenements. Third from the corner of West 19th and 10th Avenue. Place on the first floor street. You'll know it. Because there is a window there stained with the beauty of a 17-year-old girl. We finished our chat? Yes, for now. But you'll... I shall go to sleep. And pray my soul to keep. And in the morning I shall sleep. And for days and days. So you'll know. Nighty night, Mr. Clover. Leave her. And for a while walk with it in drift of April night. And from a bright lighted room where dancing was, the quick squall of recorded music and floating on it the April laughter to mix with river sound, with leaf whisper of a tree in a concrete well, with image of the night's earlier violence. And turn a corner, the street now with no laughter in it. Only the man alone, propped against a darkened doorway and murmuring to no one in particular, and to no night in particular. And farther on, the stairs, the room, the sleep. And the next morning is Tenement on West 19th, third from the corner. And try a first floor street apartment, ask... Does a young girl live here? Be told against the music of the time-tolling disc jockey, no young girl here, only a man who's always late for work because musical time clocks fascinate him. Be told, young girl across the hall, Susan Blaine. So try across the hall and be motioned into a room and be told... Yes, my daughter. Why do you ask for her? And the woman is a woman who has already, this early in the morning, applied the mask of youth to her face. Powder, rouge pale glow of lipstick, graying hair carefully combed. Why do you ask for him? Well, I'm from the police. I, uh... Surely, surely now the child has not involved herself with police. Not Susan, not my Susan. <laughs> it has to do with a man, a man who... What man? A man who was murdered last night, stabbed with a letter opener, Frank Dayton. What has his life or death or anything about him to do with my child? I was told he came here one day, sat out front in his car, watched your daughter while she stood in the window. Mr. Dayton owned this house. It gave him the right to sit out front and look at whatever he pleased. And it gave Mrs. him... Mrs. Blaine... Please. It gave him the right to come into our home and ask how we were making out. To walk through my house and suggest new wallpaper and new fixtures and to come back and ask about my child. Child? I understand she's 17 years old. Now, you listen to me. I've been married twice and I've been divorced twice and I know who's a child and who's a woman. I'd like to talk to your daughter, Mrs. Blaine. Where is she? Where she should be. In school. What school? You mean you'll go to her? You What school? The Hollidale School for Girls. Uptown. My child's in class. You're not to worry her. Do you hear? You're not... No, you don't hear. None of you ever hear. Go to her. Do what you like. Now get out. Leave me alone. <laughs> So ride the morning streets cross town and up. Skirt the Hudson and the parkway of the daydreamers. And the place you're looking for, holiday school for girls. Up the driveway between flower beds at first budding time. Park and get out. Onto the porch, clean and set with redwood furniture exactly spaced. And inside the waiting room, trophies for hockey and basketball and cooking, glass caged. And the marble statue of two girls at the feet of a teacher with arms outstretched and whose eyes are glazed in a stare at the overhanging motto, a good girl is a good mother. And in a moment, 
A Miss Mildred enters and introduces herself and listens most kindly to your wants, then leads you outside to where you will find Susan Blaine. Uh, Susan is in the garden, Mr. Clover, in the hothouses, and won't you come with her? So walk with Miss Mildred past empty playing field and nod to her theory of why young ladies should be familiar with the propagation of bulbs, ivies, and blooming plants. Finally, the section devoted to hothouses. Go into one. And Miss Mildred points out Susan Blaine. Tells you she's an extraordinary girl. You'll see why. There she is by the roses. Leaves you. Susan? Yes? My name is Danny Clover, Susan. I'm from the police. Yes? Well, what do you want of me? You knew a man named Frank Dayton, didn't you? I know Mr. Dayton. Why? He's dead, Susan. Oh, I see. How did he die? He was murdered. That's interesting, isn't it? Here's a rose. Throw it on Mr. Dayton's grave for me, will you? Thank you very much. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Tomorrow night, on most of these same stations, CBS Radio repeats an important recent broadcast, Bomb Target, USA. Arthur Godfrey is the narrator. CBS Radio newsmen report from invading air missions from the north, west, and east. In Bomb Target, USA, CBS Radio poses and dramatically answers the question, what would happen if enemy planes struck at America's chief population centers? Tomorrow night on CBS Radio, don't fail to listen to Bomb Target USA, one of the year's most important radio programs. Spring comes to Broadway in many ways. It rides the rust-stained freighter still rhymed with tropic seas, is nudged into the harbor on the snouts of eager tugs, docks at the river piers and disembarks, then softly drifts the streets, gathering sounds of city and odors and dust of city, festooned city and drapes and whirlings of warm light, and rides, too, the fragile vessel of a girl's silken skirt, and windows are flung open and hands stretched out to catch the fall of sun. Time of the waking dream, time of the smile, spring on Broadway. Where I was, April Garden to be walked with a young girl, and distantly the laughter of young girls batting spring across a high net and crouching for the return, and to a path and a bench overlooking the flow of river and sway of anchored river craft and the furlings of their bright new pennants. Oh, here, Mr. Clover. I've made room. Sit here with me. Oh. I uh, spoke with Miss Mildred. She said it was all right for you to... Oh, I know. She doesn't care how many classes I have to cut. You know why? I guess because Because you're... it thrills her, that's why. You, what you are, and what's happened. She'll have thrills for months after. <laughs> that Miss Mildred. Susan. And the girls, too. I'm sure you've noticed the whispers and the giggles and the signals being passed. They'll look up to me from now on. Not just because I'm the oldest one here. Exactly how old are you, Susan? Seventeen. It doesn't matter, does it? What? I mean... You'll talk to me as if I weren't 17, but older, and I understand things. Honestly, I do. Lots of things. Like, well, like... Like Frank Dayton? Like Mr. Dayton. Tell me about him. The way he sat outside our house in his car that day and just looked at me. I'd stand in the window and brush my hair. And it was nice that he was watching me. And the other things... What other things? The times he came to the house and brought things for Mother and me. The rides after school along the river, places to eat, and places to just sit and talk. Places I never would have known. Did he ever try to kiss you, Susan? Oh, no. Susan? Yes? You have other friends, other... Uh, some of the girls. Amy, she's the one with the scar right here on her face. And there's Ruth. No, I meant boys. You have a boyfriend, Susan? Jimmy. Jimmy Lomax. Not anymore, though. Oh? 
He was hurt, and I went to him. And after that, I didn't see him anymore. Mother took me out of public school and sent me here, where they're just girls. And I didn't see Jimmy anymore. Why? I don't know. Mother said not to worry about it, though. Mother said it didn't matter anyhow. Mother said he'd be all right. What happened to him? He was hurt. Beaten, you know. And I went to him. Then I went away from him. Where was he when you did that, Susan? Right across the street from me. He had a room there. Oh, I I think I'd better go back to class now, Mr. Grover. And... And what? If you ever meet Amy, my girlfriend, don't tell her I said she had a scar on her face. She likes to pretend she hasn't. She... Oh, well. Goodbye, Mr. Clover. Danny? Hmm? Come on in, Jim. Come on, Danny. Andy up. Drop a coin in the cigar box. Or a folded bill can also be slipped into the slot. Yeah. Uh, here you are, Gino. So you're taking up a collection for what? For Officer Pulaski. Again? Uh-huh. Well, how come every two or three weeks the cigar box goes around for Pulaski? Uh, last time it was for his daughter's confirmation. What's it for this time? Mrs. Pulaski is going to... Again? Uh, all right. Thank you, Danny. You got something for me? Just a fond wish that one day I may be passing the cigar box around for you. Danny, have you considered finding... Let's get to work, shall we, Gino? <clears throat> Very well. To wit, no news on the boy Jimmy Lomack in spite of the All Points Bulletin which is out for him. Okay, what else? That Jimmy Lomack did participate in some activity which became the concern of the police. I'm waiting, Gino. About six months ago, he was clobbered by a skillet. What? By an iron skillet which hung in his room and which came with the rent. And he was slugged with it by whom? This the boy would not reveal. Perhaps due to the embarrassment of having been knocked cold with such a ridiculous weapon. Let's go, Danny. Where? Why? Uptown. Cop on the beat just spotted Jimmy Lomax. Come on. So hit the streets again, up Broadway, when the crowd is going home. Thread of sunshine, reserved for eight-hour-day people. And they walk slow or fast, depending upon how the day went, what they're going home to, if they're going home. And Tenement Town again. 10-4, 109th Street, Danny. It's the uh, next street to your left. Five-story houses run off on an architect's ditto mechanism. And safe from the ravages of sunlight. Find an address. Officer said the third floor, room at the top of the steps. And up the stairs, which will cripple nobody if you're careful. And which route has been made scenic by those devoted to the pencil and plaster technique. Right here. Fellows from the squad car just parked, huh? That's right. Are you Jimmy Lomack? You mind if we come in? You decent, Marva? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> sure are. Now, come on in, fellas. My wife's decent. <laughs> Ain't she? Huh? Beer for the boys, honey. No, none for me, thanks. None for me either. No, just for me, Marva. Know a girl named Susan Blaine, son? Yeah, sure. Tell us about her. Well, not with Marva here, I don't know. Why not? Well, she heard me saying the things that... <laughs> All right, thanks, Marva. Uh, Marva, these boys are cops. They asked me about a girl I used to know before we got married. She wasn't like you, Marva. <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, this girl was too perfect to be true. Tell us what you mean by that, Jimmy. <laughs> Marva and me. Well, um. Well, what? Pretty. Face like a saint. It's good like one, too. Me, a guy like me, I couldn't bring myself to touch her with my little finger. She's too good for me. I was the first one to admit. Oh, no, oh, she was one. Now, how well did you know her, son? I used to live near her. That's all. And talk with her sometimes. I always had a feeling her mother was watching us. Even if we could just meet by accident two, three blocks away, I had that feeling. Go on. 
Oh, I guess I was all wrong about her, though. <laughs> How good she was, I mean. Oh? Yeah, I saw her step into a convertible one day with a guy old enough to be her father. Mm-hmm. You never know. <laughs> Marla, you, uh, you go get ready, huh? Mm-hmm. My wife and me have a date. Jimmy, police records show you were in some kind of trouble about six months ago. A bit, a bit with a skillet, you may tell us about it. Oh, that's bruises under the dam, mister. Anyway, Susan, uh, come over after it happened. She touched me, and everything got better again. Hey, look, fellas, Marby's a peculiar girl, so she, she okay, don't like Jeremy. Uh, see you around. I can open the door, can't I? Oh, hello, Mr. Clover. Hello, Susan. Are you here again? What do you want? I want to talk to both of you. Well, I don't want to... Oh, I talked with him before, Mother. When did you do that? At school. Please, come in, Mr. Clover. What do you want? Mother, that's no way to... Please sit down, Mr. Clover. Mrs. Blaine. Yes? You're pretty fond of Susan, aren't you? Well, she's too fond of me. Now keep quiet. She thinks I'm out of a storybook, I swear. Uh, will you keep quiet? Well, you do, and I'm tired of but it. Susan. Yes, Mother. Come here. Susan. Well, what do you want? Dear child. And you know what's best for me. Of course I do. Oh, stop it. Stop it. Don't do that. <laughs> See, she's a problem, don't you, Mr. Clover? No, I don't see that. Now, what would you know? I know this. I know Susan is a very lovely young lady and not a child. Let me ask you a couple of questions, Mrs. Blaine. Ask them and go. You were married twice, weren't you? I told you that myself. I know something. Susan, I told I you not to... I do so. Two husbands and Mark. But that's no business. I liked Mark. Susan, who was Mark? My mother's boyfriend. They were going to get married, but he ran away. All right. That was the final thing, wasn't it, Mrs. Blaine? Mark's running away. I don't know what you mean. Mark was a man who used to come here. (laughs) Mother. Who used to come here. I hardly knew him. One day he went away and he never came back. Susan, your mother doesn't like for you to go out with men, does she? I don't go out with men. What about Mr. Dayton? You know what he said to me once? Susan, someone sweet like you in this mad world, in this tired, troubled, mad world... I don't remember what else. But he just smiled and thanked me. Thanked me for being alive. All right, Mrs. Blaine, tell me about Jimmy Lomax. A stinking, rotten little... No, he wasn't. That's what you say about everybody I knew. You tried to kill Jimmy, didn't you, Mrs. Blaine? You heard what I said he was. Look at him and look at my daughter and you'll know why she's too good for him. Everybody I meet, you say the same thing. Because it's true. Because of what's happened to you. Child, I tell you, I know. Only I'm too smart for you. What are you talking about? Mother. What are you talking about? I know some boys. You're lying. You see, Mr. Clover? You killed Frank Dayton, didn't you, Mrs. Blaine? Susan, you... What? It's not true what you said, is it? It is true. Do you know what you are? You're a liar. (laughs) Oh, mother. Frank Dayton, Mrs. Blaine. Mrs. Blaine? I went to his house and told him to leave my daughter alone. Stop coming around here. He walked over to me and put his hand on my arm. Touched you? Yes. He touched you and you stabbed him? That's right. She can't stand that. I remember there was once a time in the subway. What do you think of your mother now, Susan? I guess I'm sorry for you. And you know what else? I'm not going to be like you. Now that... Now there'll be no one to take care of you. Uh, Don't worry, Mother. Don't worry a bit. I wasn't lying. I know lots of people. There's something about me. I don't know. People want to take care of me. (laughs) I'll get along.
Twilight lies against Broadway like gray speckled gauze, ripples off into another world. It's the street of the hurry-up step, the fast questions, the glances, the seekers after the special smile. And you walk it because once Broadway touched you, and you can't rub it off. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Sammy Hill was heard as Susan, and Betty Lou Gerson as Margaret. Featured in the cast were James McCallion, Charlotte Lawrence, Lamont Johnson, and Jan Arvin. Bill Anders speaking. Tomorrow night, Ronald Reagan will be featured as the new man on your CBS radio theater of stars. It's the story of a young doctor's struggle for trust, recognition, and a livelihood in an isolated rural community. Remember, it's your theater of stars production for tomorrow night over most of these same stations. Also tomorrow evening on CBS radio, don't miss Lionel Barrymore and Mrs. Lou Gehrig on Hall of Fame's dramatic story, Father of Baseball. And remember, the top dramatic show of all, the Lux Radio Theater, is heard Monday nights on the CBS Radio Network.